Thank you for joining today's event. Please stand by for about one minute as we let people join the room and get situated. We hope you enjoy today's presentation. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our event today. My name is Alexis Bateman, and I'm a research scientist here at MIT CTL and the director of MIT Sustainable Supply Chains. And of course, some of you will know me as the course lead for SC3X Supply Chain Dynamics. I am co-hosting this live event today with Dr. Ima Bureya, uh, course lead of SC1X and also a research scientist here at MIT CTL. Today, we're really fortunate to have Mr. Mark Backer, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Global o Operations for Hewlett Packard en Enterprises. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. Thank you and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe in some cases to everybody. It's my pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to uh, you know, this conversation. Great. We're excited to get started. And uh, first, you know, as you know, uh, we, we like to keep this interactive. And so we're going to be running some polls as we uh, go through the event. So just watch out for it to pop up onto your screen. And so we have, let's get kick off our first poll um, and, and uh, see why are you here today? So just uh, take a second to fill this out and, and then we'll, we'll get going. So over to you, Emma. Great, thanks, Alexis. Um, for about the next five minutes, Mark will provide some context on Hewlett Packard Enterprises and some background about his role. After that, Alexis and I will ask some questions we have prepared based on questions we, we have received already from, from some of you. And the last 20 minutes will be saved for your questions. So uh, be ready to ask us good questions. Use the webinar Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screen to ask these questions and be sure you are logged with your name because we won't be reading any anonymous questions. And uh, just to reinforce what Alexis said, we will be sharing some polls uh, during the event. So be prepared to participate. Let's check the results of that poll, Alexis. I think we have like, like quite a few people have already responded. So um, why are you here today? Uh, so most of you are already working in the area of supply chain management, 46% of, of all the participants, which is wonderful. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm also happy that uh, none of you had nothing else to do today. So that is, <laughs> that is good that you guys are all very busy people and we appreciate that and appreciate you sharing that time with us. But uh, yes, definitely getting the practitioner and, and uh, executive input uh, is great to have today. Um, yeah, and I guess and, some more people yeah. are ahead. just, yeah, just want to get inspired uh, to take the next step in their careers because they want to move uh, to supply chain, to the supply chain space and work there in the future, which yes. is also great. This is a great uh, area to work in. Yep, yep. No, so thanks for sharing that. And also, I guess all of you guys know what HPE stands for. So glad that, that that's uh, already assumed here. So, um, uh, so we have um, next on the agenda. Um, so. we, oh, go Mark, ahead. Yeah. So Mark, would you like to kick it off and introduce uh, yourself and give a brief overview of HP? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, you know, take a few minutes to uh, to talk about that. So. Um, we start, uh, I think you introduced me. Hi, everybody, Mark Bucker. Um, uh, I lead global operations for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, is uh, a, you could call it a spin-off uh, of the original Hewlett Packard company, uh, founded in 1939 by Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, um, also um, considered as the founding fathers uh, of Silicon Valley. They founded the company uh, in 1939 in Palo Alto, California. It's a small town, small town in the 
San Francisco Bay Area, uh, about 30 minutes south of San Francisco. Uh, for those of you um, you know, don't know where, where that is. And uh, they founded it in uh, a garage. Uh, that garage still exists. Um, by the way, it's, it's considered a, a little bit of a monument uh, in the Silicon Valley uh, area, as I said, because it's considered uh, the early start uh, of Silicon Valley as a tech uh, haven uh, with lots of development. And in that area, as, as many of you may know, uh, still today, there's lots of headquarter, tech headquartered companies. And not too far away, stone throw away is Google, is Facebook, Apple has massive headquarters there, uh, just to name a few. And, um, you know, over the years, there has been, um, you know, lots of money made and lots of money uh, put into venture capital, private equity, invested in startups. And that's how, you know, Silicon Valley continued to grow and grow and grow. Um, as I said, companies existed in quite some time. Um, company originally mostly known for its uh, printing business. Uh, HP DeskJet, LaserJet printers, uh, known for its uh, personal computing products, uh, notebooks, laptops, desktop products, uh, as well as uh, server networking equipment and services around that. Uh, about five years ago, almost six years ago, uh, the company went through a significant restructuring and separated itself in two pieces. Uh, one piece is HP. Uh, still considered HP, which takes care of print and personal systems uh, or PC clients. Uh, and the other part, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, which is focused on the enterprise side of products, uh, server business, storage, data management, uh, networking equipment, and its associated services. That's the area where I work uh, and lead the global operations organization. Uh, global operations is a combination of what is considered uh, customer operations, everything front end, taking care of order management activities, processing orders, invoicing orders, fulfilling orders, uh, quoting, uh, pricing, uh, and so on. And then there is what you could call classic supply chain activities, a part of global operations uh, and classic supply chain activities include planning everything around planning. Planning is everything. We can talk more about that as we continue the dialogue, but demand planning, forecasting, supply planning, uh, inventory planning uh, included in there, but also the manufacturing activities to, to bring a product to life, fulfilling the product logistics, uh, engineering is included in that sourcing, very important sourcing of parts, um, you know, to build the product in the factories. Um, so true end-to-end -end supply chain activities fall under my uh, responsibility. And uh, we are here to support the business. We're here to support customers on the front end, the customer operations piece. We are here to support the business to be successful. When they sell products, you know, we want to make sure that customers get their products, you know, delivered. Because the reality is, um, if you sell but you do not deliver, the company doesn't make any revenue or doesn't make any profit off of it because the customer doesn't pay for something he doesn't receive. So it's fairly simple that way, a critical role. And so for those of you who are thinking about uh, being a, a supply chain practitioner, I can only recommend you to take it very serious and do it because it's the most exciting part of the business because you are in the middle of everything and touching every part of a company um, from a front end engaging with customers to being involved in manufacturing and sourcing uh, supporting you know the p l performance of uh, of a business and so on so um, if i haven't convinced you yet in about 50 minutes from now i it's my goal to convince you that you should be considering a career in supply chain Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the great introduction to HPE and also for the passionate uh, defense of the supply chain management space, which I, I could not agree more that supply chain is so relevant for, for the business and how it connects everything and how it's so, right. so interesting to work in that space. Um, so now let's, let's dive into some questions. And actually, my first question is very much related to what you just uh, said. Um, in one of our courses, SC1X Supply Chain Fundamentals, the one 
I'm running. Um, we just teach, you know, these fundamentals that you use daily at work. And you just mentioned some of those, forecasting, inventory management, transportation management. So can you talk a little bit more about some uh, of those applications and how they impact the top and bottom line of your business? Yeah, um, that's very exciting, actually. Um, and we only have, uh, you know, about an hour. I can talk for days, you know, on, on these topics and how relevant and how important they are. I said, planning is everything. Uh, and uh, that truly is the case. Not to, you know, to minimize, marginalize, you know, the importance of other domains or functional areas in a supply chain environment, but it starts with a plan. Um, and, and it's fairly simple. Demand, you know, customers, you know, are particularly in an enterprise environment, customers are thinking about what they're going to spend their money on. They have budgets to spend um, and, and what infrastructure or what investments are they going to make in the, in the next year. Um, and um, what is very uh, challenging in a supply chain environment is to know early enough what the demand is going to look like, what are customers going to order from us. And when you think about a tech product, a, whether it is a PC or a printer or, you know, in, in our case, a server, there is a lot of components that go in there. There is memory chips, there is processors, there's motherboards, there is a storage device, hard disk drive or solid state drives and network cards, you know, all those things, you know, and make up a product and you need to know how many of those parts you, you, you need where in your supply chain, in your manufacturing network. Um, and um, if you are wrong, if you plan it wrongly, so you do not have enough parts, you get customer orders, you know, that you cannot fulfill within a certain period of time. If you have too many parts at the end of a period, you sit on inventory which has a value and that value sits on your balance sheet is a drag on your cash conversion cycle on your cash performance cash flow performance for the company which if you are a private company you may be able to you know handle it depending on you know your financial statements and how much cash you actually have available uh, but if you're a publicly traded company um, you know, stock, stock listed, you know, that can be uh, an influencer in the performance of your, of your stock on, uh, on the stock exchange. So, um, you know, two things. One is, you know, if you, if you don't plan right, you, you have two evils, which is one is, you know, your customers will not be happy with you because they place an order and you tell them, well, I can only service you five months from now. Uh, and the other way around is, you know, I have too much stuff, your financial performance, uh, you know, takes a hit. So planning, super important, um, and it goes into a lot of detail. So uh, it's actually, again, you know, for those of you who are interested in that, a very fascinating uh, data rich environment, you know, where uh, data science, data management, analytics, etc., comes together with managing, you know, the physical world of parts and components, you know, in, um, in an environment. So uh, planning, forecasting, uh, hugely important in the value chain, um, you know, as such. I, I hope I answered that, uh, Ima. Uh, yeah, that's to perfect. Go deeper or in another, I can go, like I said, I can talk for hours on this. <laughs> This is great. And actually, uh, you highlighted one point that we always we repeat over and over and over during our courses that in supply chains, you always have to de make these decisions that are trade offs right. between having too much and having too little. And just finding the right balance is very challenging, but it's also like a, the way to go. Uh, so thanks so much, Mark. I think that uh, you responded. And I think to one, um, one important aspect of that as well is depending on you know, the company, the product, and uh, you know, the characteristics of that. Um, there is there is sometimes this this aspect of a perishable you know perishable you know is a term you know which goes both ways one is from a customer demand point of view customer demand can be perishable think about uh, government spend you know government spend has a budget for the year and typically they have to spend it before a certain date and if they don't that budget is gone because we've moved into the next year that's how, you know, that demand might be perishable. So if you do not take the order, fulfill the order, it's gone. It will not come back. And so perishable. 
the flip side is, you know, from a material point of view or inventory point of view, uh, some some products, you know, or some parts, you know, they can perish as well, right? They're no longer, you know, um, you know, current or especially when you go down, you know, pharma or you know, food, uh, you know, things, things, you know, and, and then you have to write it off, which, you know, is costing a lot of money, right? So um, depending on what the product set is and so on, those are things that become even, even more important. Definitely. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that was super interesting. Definitely thinking about sort of some of the fundamentals we're teaching right now and, and how we're coming to some of those perspectives and how you can apply it in, in your situation. And of course, not that there's any right answer sometimes it's a, it's a juggle to trade off um so let's uh, launch our second poll which is uh a fun hpe trivia so i wish i had a drawing but i don't so let's see which of you guys get it right so just uh <laughs> i can see there's a pause on filling this out so that everyone's furiously go googling this um so to see if you can get this right but while while everyone responds um, I know this is the the, the question and, and the elephant in the room of, of the last year, um, you know, given that you are uh, running global supply chains and global operations, you know, how have you seen COVID-19 and the disruptions, uh, you know, not just COVID-19, but the disruptions of the, the course of the last year really um, challenge and complicate global supply chain management and perhaps also how you've seen it um, drive innovation uh, in, in terms of um, the, what, what has been happening over over that time period. Yeah, um, you know, the, um, in recent years in, in particular, uh, supply chain disruptions, you know, have become, uh, you know, a, a more common term um, where um, even, you know, uh, nowadays, you know, the White House, you know, uh, in the United States, right, starts to talk about it, which is a good thing. We can, we can go there um, if you like. Um, but supply chain disruptions, you know, are, yeah, they're significant. And I keep telling everybody they're becoming more, more frequently, and they're becoming bigger. Um, I've been doing this for you know, close to 20 years in the meantime. And over those years, I've seen various forms of disruptions with um, significant floods in, in Thailand, you know, that disrupted the hard disk um, drive manufacturing. All of hard drive manufacturing was basically concentrated in Thailand. Uh, earth, earthquakes uh, resulting in tsunamis in Japan. Japan is very much involved in, you know, components uh, techno technological supply chain uh, activity, which which disrupted, um, uh, seen volcano eruptions in Iceland that you know created an ash cloud over you know Western Europe, which disrupted you know air freight and um, air freight is hugely important when you talk about logistics and transportation, right? The amount of uh, goods that are being transported by air, you know, and if you don't do that, your supply chain gets disrupted. So they've seen many over the years, but most of the time, uh, those are, call it isolated in one particular area. I mean, the, there's other examples of a uh, factory, a, a factory uh, catching fire, you know, which reduces a significant amount of capacity uh, globally but it's contained in one area. The difference with um, last year is that the pandemic, um, you know, affected everything and everybody almost at the same time. Uh, nobody spared and uh, impacted, you know, uh, from finished goods manufacturing facilities to component manufacturing facilities to logistics networks because of local authority um, restrictions on moving of people and goods, uh, even to the point of um, if we would be able to find parts, build them and ship them, customers being closed because they shut down their offices um, and there's nobody to receive you know, anything. So uh, from that perspective, this, the pandemic, you know, and I, I always say, you know, we, we plan, you know, a, a, 
a good supply chain organization has, uh, you know, a focus on business continuity planning and, you know, how do you react to disruptions and so on. But typically it's a reactive activity. You always review the latest event that happened and you adjust your plan accordingly. And so what did we learn from this event and what do we need to adjust in our continuity planning? Um, and so that's great, but you know, you never plan for the eventuality of the next, and we don't know what the next one is. We know something's coming. After the pandemic, you know, there is a new disruption coming. The the actually the latest and the greatest already happened, which was the vessel that got stuck in the Suez Canal, um, you know, which disrupted, you know, about 10%, 15% of global trade. Um, uh, some more affected than others, but you know, we were also focused on pandemic-related stuff. Did anybody think about, you know, what 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 are we going to do if if a vessel gets stuck in the Suez Canal? Uh, and then there is plans, you know, that happen uh, along the way. So um, I, I think it opened our eyes uh, to even more global disruption happening at the same time. I think, you know, from our perspective, we look at that and say, are we, and, and the new buzzword in supply chain lingo, but even CEOs and, um, you know, boards uh, of companies now think about supply chain disruptions and they talk about resiliency and agility uh, associated with that. Uh, are we resilient? Um, I think many of us will say, yeah, we were resilient because you think of it, it took the world maybe one quarter, three, four months. And after that, you know, uh, we restarted uh, global supply chains fairly quickly. Um, biggest disruption that everybody probably experienced was we ran out of toilet paper. Uh, we did, but it took us maybe a month, two months, three months to figure that one out. And then, you know, we all had toilet paper again. So we have a certain level of resiliency, you know, built in. And I think considering the, the magnitude of the pandemic, we have we've proven that we are resilient, but are we resilient enough? Uh, probably not, because we want to be even faster. We don't want three months, four months, you know, before we feel that we have enough toilet paper, you know, on the shelves uh, again, right? We want it to be a week, two weeks, or board members or CEOs want it to not happen at all. Um, now, that is more difficult. Um, resiliency, agility in the supply chain environment comes with a cost. You can, you can duplicate your entire infrastructure, say, you know, I have one factory, you know, in the east and one factory in the west, and they do the same thing. Uh, if this one goes down, you know, um, you know, I have that one taking over, but then you have a lot of idle capacity, which has a lot of cost. You have a lot of inventory sitting in both places, which is very expensive. Um, so there is this, this right balance to find, you know, in terms of I want to be resilient and agile. And agility is probably the more important aspect of this whole resiliency and disruption conversation, which means you know how fast can you switch how fast can you react and resolve the problem um, and and um, I think that's where we're learning a lot you know about the importance of data the importance of systems the importance of uh, visibility on you know in your entire supply chain what is happening where where are your uh, capacity constraints, your your overcapacity. Where are your parts, your components? Um, do I, you know what are your inventory levels? How fast can I move you know inventory from A to B to to fix a, a, you know a disruption? Um, but also overall, I think this is where again you know supply chain becomes a fascinating space to work in the importance of IT, IT solutions, applications, et cetera, and the connection. Supply chain cannot function well without a proper architecture and a proper infrastructure of tools and systems and processes that provide the right level of visibility, which you then can use for multiple reasons to react to the agility piece, but also to be better in terms of the way you serve customers and so on. So I think we, we knew that already, but the whole pandemic situation only amplified, you know, the importance uh, of that. 
Yeah, no, that was really interesting and, and thinking about uh, one dimension that you mentioned was um, now that the supply chain has, you know, a, a, the clearing of shelves and those physical manifestations of that disruption, it's escalated it to conversations that may not have existed before, such as at the C-suite level or, you know, in the White House. And of course, my dad finally knows what a supply chain is, most important of all those factors. So I think, uh, you know, do you see that, that um, recognition of the criticality of supply chains changing the dynamic of the, the investment of resources to plan? For, for disruption or, or do you see some some change as a result of that? No, absolutely. I think um, the, you know, the importance of supply chain or recognition for supply chain as a, a critical business process, if you want, you know, increased substantially, increased, you know, during pandemic, but actually it started uh, already before, um, before the pandemic. There's, you know, several events um, that triggered, um, you know, reactions from, you know, CEOs and boards of companies, etc., which was more, not, not so much pandemic related, but global trade and trade tension related. Uh, the introduction of uh, import duties or tariffs on products manufactured in China um, created a significant wave of you know, uh, reactions, you know, in particularly in the United States uh, companies, you know, a lot of companies headquartered in the United States, US companies, you know, they have a significant portion of their business, you know, depending on the, the you know, the revenue they, they make in the United States, have, you know, for many, many years enjoyed zero, zero import duty, zero tariffs, you know, on their products, all of a sudden, you know, it became 15%, 25%. Uh, and that's a huge impact, right? If you think of it, you know, all of a sudden you have 25% more cost. Um, uh, and, and if you don't plan for it and consumers that buy those products not necessarily want to see prices go up by 25%, you know, because of it. So that created, you know, already a lot more interest, you know, in the whole concept of supply chain um, and other dimensions as well. But um, I pandemic again amplified some of that. Um, what I'm seeing, you know, I rep as the global operations lead, I report to the CEO. I'm a member of the executive leadership team of the company. Um, take it five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, the supply chain leader would probably be sitting in a level two, level three part of the organization. Um, uh, and doing more or less the same thing, but the the, the impact um, in multiple areas, you know, um, has triggered the, the attention of, of leadership teams and boards and so on. And, and like you said, including uh, politics. Um, and it's about, you know, the impact on the financials of a company, but also other things have become more and more relevant. Again, resiliency, agility, disruptions related, um, you know, important, but also uh, social, environmental, corporate responsibility aspects, you know, become more and more important. We are seeing, you know, as one of those things is that corporate enterprise and, and even more so public sector, so government agencies are making some of those aspects part of their RFQ. So when they when they tender, you know, their business saying, I'm interested in buying, you know, a, a ton of equipment from, you know, somebody, but I want to know, you know, is the product you are selling to me, you know, is there anything around conflict minerals or, you know, uh, labor, you know, la labor issues or, you know, what's your impact on the environment, the way you manufacture stuff or the way you transport stuff. You know, I want to understand and it becomes a criteria for decision making more and more. And because of that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, more people start paying attention, you know, to those things. Right. So definitely seen, you know, that happen over the, the years I've been involved in this, that, yeah, it becomes more of a conversation in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, the, the, the most recent, um, you know, example of that is uh, in the tech industry, um, there is a, a, another issue happening right now, which is the, the semiconductor shortage, right? Or the chips shortage you read about in the news. 
um, due to significantly more demand or you know recovery after pandemic happening faster than anybody anticipated but also more uh, segments sectors you know needing those chips um, automotive uh, you know cars nowadays you know have a lot more technology in them than uh, they used to maybe 10 15 20 years ago um, smartphones you know keep growing uh, people working from home, studying from home, all need laptops, um, you know, and more so than than ever before. We have um, the, the the switch from 4G to 5G uh, on smartphone on uh, on telecom, which comes with IoT, right? Internet of Things. There's more devices that can connect and they can talk in you know through mobile networks. So more and more of those chips required. Now there is a shortage. Everybody is, you know, concerned about it. Automotive plants, you know, are down. They're not producing as many ca cars as they can. They have uh, millions of backlog because they're missing a 25 cent part. That's it, right? A whole car cannot be finished because they're missing one 25 cent part. Um, and so that has led to uh, President Biden, you know, doing a, a workshop two weeks ago with leaders from the tech industry to talk about how can we fix this problem? What do, where do we need to invest in more chip uh, capacity? Uh, we are too dependent on Taiwan, on China, you know, for, you know, chips. And we need to invest in the United States because we need to reduce that dependency. So you see how, you know, supply chain as a concept, as a as a practice becomes more and more relevant, more important, and enters, you know, whole, a whole range of new discussions, which is, you know, it's good, it's exciting. Um, uh, living that shortage, you know, is not so exciting, but, you know, <laughs> you know, like I said, you know, if it's not this one, it will be something else, you know, in the years to come, so. Yes, absolutely. No, that was, that was awesome, really awesome coverage of kind of how it's evolved over the last few years. Um, so let's uh, get back to our poll. Ima, do you want to? No, I just wanted to thank Mark for the, the oh. great uh, no explanation and how like just keep frame it so well, like so in so many different sources for the disruptions and also the trade-offs again about like you have a budget, how do you allocate that budget to prepare for an uncertain future? So yes. uh, again, we see that that concept uh, of how you make those decisions. Um, let's go with the poll. So right. did so, people get it right? <laughs> So the, the most popular answer was walkie talkies for the military. So, um, you know, that, that is certainly one, one potential. I was hoping you guys were gonna pick personal computer for NASA, uh, but the actual answer is audio oscillator for Disney. Uh, so that was the original. Um, uh, the first product, $500, that was it. <laughs> so just some, some fun shibri there, thanks, uh, thanks for that. Great. So uh, let's continue with uh, another question. And I think this one connects very well with something you mentioned earlier, Mark. Um, you were talking about IT, an appropriate IT infrastructure for the supply chain to provide this end-to-end -end visibility that allows you to make better decisions. And now, like, and in, in the future too. So all these eruption we've seen in the past year and the other ones you mentioned, right? Uh, has, we've seen that that has driven innovation and also digital transformation in many companies. So could you share a little bit how has HP innovated and built more resilience uh, just through implementing more digital technologies? Yeah, um, super trendy uh, supply chain disruptions, resilience, agility, super trendy words, right? Digital transformation, also very trendy. Uh, uh, trendy words, um, but you know, very important. Um, actually, you know, from the company perspective, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, you know, there is there is the two parts, right? The job I have, you know, that requires you know, uh, digital transformation and uh, a solid architecture and infrastructure to support that. But the company sells, you know, solutions, you know, that that help do digital transformation for companies, right? So. Um, it's a it's a important you know on top of mind you know for me from multiple aspects. Um, what have we done? Uh, and you know we hear uh, uh, you know others you know do that. There, there's a lot of development in new systems and capabilities. But first of all, 
a lot of companies, it, the, the backbone of any supply chain and operational environment is um, the ERP system, enterprise resource planning. Um, and what you see typically is companies over the years, you know, they big companies, large enterprise companies, they go through growth, they acquire other companies, they, you know, they started off being, you know, a decentralized company, you know, and then they started centralizing and globalizing more, uh, resulting in, you know, having 10, 15, 20 different versions of ERP, um, which, you know, if you're the supply chain guy is a nightmare because that means, you know, you have 20 different versions, you know, of data to look at. So what you want to do is try to get to one single instance of an ERP. Um, but one single instance of an ERP in a global company that runs billions and billions of dollars in transactions through it is also a challenge because then you get into performance issues and, you know, and so on, right? So, uh, but a lot has happened uh, over the years with large companies like SAP and Oracle, um, you know, developing new state-of-the-art, you know, 2021, 2022 style solutions there. So what we've done, um, as, as have others, you know, migrated our ERP system to the latest version. Um, it, that's tricky because, like as I said, it's the backbone of the company. And so, you know, it's like open heart surgery, um, you know, what you're doing because you're running your shop and you're trying to put something new in place. Uh, you still have lots of customers that place orders that need to be fulfilled and so on, right? So. Um, those are exciting things. So that's one. The other one is, um, you know, uh, investments in the planning solutions, um, you know, demand planning, uh, forecasting, um, and so on, investments there. Um, but the most, I think the most impactful and, um, you know, where there's a lot of development from a digital transformation um, and uh, investments in IT infrastructure architecture is the capturing of data. Um, the, the, the biggest challenge, you know, in a supply chain environment is that it's end to end, right? You go from uh, customer demand, which talks about a unit, a sales guy wants to talk dollars. Uh, the manufacturing guy wants to talk units. The sourcing guy wants to talk parts. I don't care about how many end, you know, finished goods, you know, you're talking, I need to know how many hard drives, how many processors, you know, how many, how many network cards I need to go buy and which ones. Um, the logistics guy doesn't care about that. He cares about kilos. He cares about pallets. He cares about containers, you know, ocean vessels, air, air, airplane ULDs. Uh, you know, and, and uh, cost per kilogram, you know, an uplifting that stuff, right? So, so each of them have their own version unit of measure and each of them will generate tons of data. And, you know, uh, if you then have, you know, my logistics data in one database with those units of measures and I have my planning database and my manufacturing database, how do I take all that stuff and aggregate it and make some sense out of it from an end-to-end, left-to-right perspective, right? That's where there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of investment as well. Visibility is hugely important and huge investments, creating networks uh, whereby you hook up suppliers and logistics providers and manufacturing partners, etc. You hook them up into a network where all the data comes together and then you put this layer of data analytics, data science, um, and now we go into the artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, that can help a, a ton. That's the next evolution uh, if you think about uh, digital transformation. Um, you know, we're investing in, uh, from a demand planning forecasting point of view, is that, you know, we have a lot of historical data. What algorithms can we develop that will help us to be more accurate in our forecasting um, at the component level. Um, so that's, you know, where, uh, as I said in the beginning, it becomes a really fascinating place because, you know, it combines, you know, a physical supply chain world with, you know, data, the logical world. And, you know, depending on what your passion is, you know, you can, you can find, you know, 
jobs and, and interesting things to work on in, in this environment easily. If you're an engineer, if you're a data scientist, if you're a business guy, if you are a planner, you know, all these different, you know, aspects, you know, are there. Uh, but yeah, uh, digital transformation, investment in tools, um, you know, is, is a big hype, very important, because as I said, you know, there's more and more data uh, available and to manage all that data the right way and, and take advantage of it and make better decisions along the supply chain uh, is going to be very helpful, but it takes, yeah, a lot of work and, uh, you know, um, education development uh, of all of us on what we can do with it. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think like uh, digital transformation is a huge challenge and anyone that is like uh, trying to make it happen in their company know that it is, but it's also necessary. It's a step that everyone needs to take uh, to be competitive and remain competitive. I loved how you highlighted the role of supply chain as this connector and translator between all these different parts of the supply chain and even the company and also with external stakeholders and, and uh, partners. So I think that's a, that's a key element also in the digital transformation and a role that only supply chain management can play. Yep, that's right. Yeah, I thought that was really fascinating. Just kind of putting in sort of those, you know, sort of that singular objective of each of those roles, right? That they need to get their job done, but really to make supply chain effective, you have to look across all those functions and put them together. And so just just the, the huge, um, the, the significance of it was, it was really um, amazing. So you touched on it a little bit um, earlier, but it's something near and dear to, to my heart and, and, and many uh, on the line, I'm sure, is the shift to sustainability and supply chain. We've seen um, clearly there's there's a push for sustainability def, you know, broadly in, in business, but the, the centralization and strategicness of, of supply chain you know, pushing or you know, owning sustainability, driving it across the value chain. Can you can you talk a little bit about how you you've seen that and, and what do you think it means for you know some of the professionals we have on the line? Yeah, um, <clears throat> sustainability um, again has you know different aspects. Um, you know, there is a social you know aspect to it there's an environmental aspect to it um i, I think those are equally important uh, i i you know i engage with a fair amount of peers of mine you know practitioners in different companies even different industries uh, you know from you know uh, consumer goods uh, pharmaceuticals tech uh, and so on and everybody you know is is um you know, has one way or another. We had a, a big session with uh, Unilever uh, a couple of weeks ago, where they, um, the chief supply chain officer of Unilever, talked about, you know, why uh, and, and how they give, you know, sustainability uh, or how they've made that a, a big agenda, all the way up to the the, the, the executive level, um, the, the boardroom level. Um, it's just simply, you know, everybody realizes, like us in, you know, in our daily lives, we've become a lot more conscious about, you know, the impact we all have on uh, the planet um, and uh, the role we can and need to play. And there is, you know, one big truth, which is in the supply chain environment, supply chain has a huge impact. Um, you know, logistics, manufacturing, right? Depending on what you manufacture, how you manufacture and any kind of emissions, you know, that are there, you know, have an impact. Logistics, CO2 emissions, you know, the worst offender, uh, believe it or not, to CO2 emissions is ocean freight. If you look at these ocean vessels, you know, and, and you know, what they produce, um, you know, these big diesel engines, you know, uh, in the transportation air freight you know similar so uh, it, it's simply you know no denying that doing those things you know has an has co2 emissions are there which is bad for you know the environment and we need to be conscious about it um uh, so it's just simply the right thing to do to focus on it secondly um as we all as consumers uh, as human beings you know become more sensitive to this we are also human beings that have a professional life. We work in companies. We are people that become decision makers in these companies. And as we become more sensitized and conscious about you know, the impact, we build that into the decision making process of what we buy. 
uh, when you, you know, we want to separate our waste, we go to supermarkets and we look at the labels and things like that, right? So that finds itself into procurement departments in companies and when they, like I said, when they tender. So uh, when you then run a business, there's the two aspects. You want to do what's right. Uh, and secondly, your customers are asking for it. So it becomes an imperative by design um, to, to focus on and to do the right thing. Um, that's mostly, you know, the most sensitivity is, is around the environmental stuff. But for us, you know, in the larger HP company and Hewlett Packard Enterprise now for many years, we've also been very concerned about um, labor conditions. Um, we set up you know, together with our tech partners, um, you know, in the industry, think about Apple and, and so on, set up huge factories in China uh, where all these products are being manufactured. Millions of people work in there. Um, and the conditions in some of these are manufacturing places that, that have 250, 500,000 people that live in the factory dorm um, you know, um, uh, for, for uh, they go to work, they're on the production line, and at night they go to their dorm, there is some entertainment, they get their food, etc. Uh, and so those conditions, you know, have been a focus for us in the tech industry, for sure, right? Um, because it's just the right thing to do. We can't, you know, it's just not right, you know, when you know, people are working 15 hour days and hardly get food, uh, hardly get breaks, you know, seven days a week, uh, you know, are treated, you know, badly, you know, that's it's just not right. So we shouldn't let that happen. Um, similar, you know, when you go into tech, <clears throat> some of the components or raw material required to build components, you know, printed circuit boards and all those uh, integrated circuits, etc. Those raw components, where they come from, it's a, a mining. And so, what are the conditions? You know, in mining, are we sending little kids into mines? You know, the conflict mineral story in Africa. You know, those are things that are hugely important. Um, you know, and it's hard because it goes deep into up. You know, upstream into your supply chain, right? It goes from raw material building this stuff, and how do you control all those things? Um, <clears throat> And, you know, um, again, you know, it's just the right thing to do um, for the people, the planet um, uh, around us. Uh, and um, we need to keep working it. Is it perfect? I don't think it's perfect, right? I mean, there's stuff happening every day, all day in certain places from a, you know, people impact perspective in communities around the world, um, from an environmental perspective, it's a challenge, right? Because we all want stuff you know, to be built and we want it cheap and we want it fast and, you know, then it's easy to cut corners, but it has an impact and we need to be conscious about it and we need to find ways, all of us together on how we solve that problem. Yeah, that was that was really well said, really interesting. I think you know, as as many uh, explore sustainability, right? They they jump really to the to the environmental issues because they're easier to quantify. They're the kind of uh, very um, physical manifestation of you know sustainability as it was stack, you know yeah. it was defined originally. But as you so rightly said, the social side is 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 critical to our supply chains and is sort of a hidden issue that people really don't understand about some of the the conditions that are deep in supply chains that are at the raw material phase of, of mining and, and production. And um, I think it was just really great to kind of look at the big there picture is, of sustainability that it's all encompassing. And, yeah. and, and there is this aspect of um, cost that comes into play. You know, one big problem where probably many of us are aware of is the amount of plastic in ocean, right? Huge opportunity that provides a huge source of material um, to collect it right, to, to, to melt it and to reuse it as resin, you know, becoming plastics, you know, for products and so on. But it's cheaper, you know, to pump oil out of the ground, you know, make resin, you know, virgin resin as they call it, you know, and use that. It's cheaper than to go out into the ocean, collect all this stuff, then you need to melt it, you need to clean it because it's not, you know, virgin, so colors, you know, things like that. You know, we've had this big debate in the company, uh, in our printing division about, you know, building white printers. And, you know, you take virgin, 
plastic, you can make it as white as white can be. You use recycled plastic, getting it white as white can be is practically impossible because there's contamination in it, you know, one way or another. And the amount of time you would have to clean it and filter it and so on is just not practical, not possible even. But then the question becomes as consumers, right? How important is it that that printer is white as white can be, or is it okay if it's a little bit less white? Or is it okay, you know, to pay $5 more so that we can collectively, you know, go out, collect all these bottles, you know, plastic, you know, from the ocean, et cetera, recycle it and so on. Uh, and those are, you know, the really fundamental societal questions, you know, that we, we, we struggle with because many of us as consumers, if you're not involved in it, you just don't know, you know, some of these practicalities of it or the differences, right? And the fact that we should, you know, this is one big theme in supply chain that we need to do a lot more circular, circular economy uh, and, you know, really start reusing, recycling materials in a much better way um, to avoid having to keep pulling, you know, from the planet for, for raw material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I thought it was really a good example to bring about the plastics and the, and the choices um, between obviously, you know, ocean plastics and the, and the challenges of collection and, and the extra cost there. So I think that's a, a great way to frame it. So um, I think we're going to uh, run our last poll. Uh, Emma, do you want to grab some questions to start with so we can yes. get a few questions before we end? I think I, I can launch the poll. Okay, oh, great. It's Perfect. out. So one last poll uh, for you guys. Uh, and while you respond to that, we can start like just picking on some of your questions. We have a bunch of questions, 48 questions. I don't think we have time to go through all of them, but uh, we'll pick up some. Uh, I think these are, there are really great questions in this pool. Yes. So um, let's start with this one. It's about um, actually the people I do choose, choose to work in your team. So what is one of the skills you consider most valuable for someone working in the supply chain? Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, um, there, there's multiple skills that I think are important, um, but uh, I would say um, nowadays, depend, no matter what domain, whether it is planning or transportation or logistics or manufacturing, engineering, etc. I think the, um, you know, most important skill uh, is, uh, you know, almost like curiosity, focus on innovation. There's innovation, you know, possible in each and every one of these areas. Um, innovation, you know, with a customer mindset, right? Um, focused on what what will help our customers be more successful. Innovation in you know in process improvement, um, analytics. You know, we talked about data, the abundance of available data, and using that data to your advantage. I think is is really um, you know uh, important skill. Digital transformation, innovation of processes and and uh, procedures. Um, customer centricity, uh, very important, um, you know, because that's why we're here, um, business acumen, you know, so there's, uh, you know, a, a lot of those uh, things that, that can help depending on what you do, a uh, technical stuff, like I said, you know, even if you're an engineer, working in a supply chain environment, engineering products, you know, need to be introduced into a manufacturing environment, or quality, you know, uh, we want to build products that have quality, that you know, customers can actually use and don't have to return or repair. Um, so, uh, yeah, depending on which domain, there is plenty of interesting skills required and, uh, and, and apply. Okay, so data literacy and like skills, innovation and customer centric would be like yeah. three of the pillars. And then, Absolutely. of course, beyond that, like uh, many other skills. Thanks, Mark. Alexis, yeah. would you like to pick another one? Yeah, absolutely. So Darjat asks, um, I thought it was good. You talked about resiliency. So he's, he's asking how the resilience, how resiliency was implemented in your supply chain um, during the pandemic and, and now into the, the new normal and, and sort of how you're, how you're, you're building resiliency in. So we, we did another, um, you know, a round of uh, working with our manufacturing facilities and partners and suppliers on, you know, taking a look at their business continuity plans. 
we revisited you know uh, areas where we felt you know um, uh, you know we might be single sourced um, you know from a component supply perspective so if you if you're single sourced and that one supplier has one factory and that one goes down right that that limits your ability to react so uh, we looked at that um, we looked at you know our system capabilities to transfer quickly from one location to another um, because sometimes you know people think that it's easy you know or just move manufacturing of product A to another location. But if you don't have your system set up, don't have your products set up in the system on what the bill of material is to go build, you know, that product, you know, you can move the material, but the line worker doesn't know what to do with that order because he doesn't see it in his system, right? So we looked at things like that. Um, uh, we looked obviously again uh, at all the locations around the world where they are and are they more susceptible to disruptions uh, than, than, than other places. Um, and those have been some of the things uh, we, we have been working on. We're not done. Um, there's more um, because as I said, you know, this has opened our eyes to a whole new concept of disruptions when it happens everywhere at the same time as opposed to one single area you know that is affected so more more than that can and needs to be done yeah absolutely <clears throat> so going back to the to the digital transformation discussion that we started earlier uh people are wondering what is the approach or your approach uh, to increase adherence to the new tools and processes that you're implementing? You talk about the challenge of like bringing everyone together in the new ERP system. So how are you actually like uh, incentivizing people to, to make this move? You know, the, the interesting, so there, there's two parts to it. One is, um, you know, when you go through those mega transformation activities, um, and you implement new systems, the, one of the important aspects uh, of the process or the project itself is to switch off the old one. Uh, so, you know, you, you transition and you migrate over to the new one. And once you're done and everybody's on the new one, you switch off the other one so that nobody can go back uh, because that would be a disaster, right? If, if you, an ERP system, new orders need to come into your new ERP system. If they keep coming in the old one, you know, you, I mean, that, that's, you know, complete chaos, you know, from there and forward. So switching off, um, you know, the, um, the old system is one. And the second one is the new systems, new ERPs, you know, they're, they're designed and developed in a way most of the time that they guide the process, right? So it's built on a business process or a business process is built on the systemic capabilities. Um, and, you know, um, in some cases, you know, these things become a lot more rigorous. So, you know, depending on what you do in the process, you, you sometimes don't even have a choice to, to you know, to, to, to follow, you know, how the new system will do these things. And then it's change management with these big transformations, management of change, you know, having, you know, helping people to migrate over change is hard. I mean, we can talk for another hour about, you know, change management, management of change, how do you do these big projects, right? And, and how do you get people um, you know, to adopt and adapt to, to change, you know, that's, it's, it's hard. It's really hard because, um, people are used to something and, you know, you give them something new or something different and into migrate over is always a challenge. Some people are, you know, more eager to do that kind of stuff. Some people are more conservative and say, you know, I just like the way things are today. Um, and you need to manage that very carefully. Yeah, absolutely. That's really helpful. So uh, supply chains need to be agile and, and people as well. And so That's learning right. and, and upgrading all the time. Um, so we'll just, uh, so we have 50 more questions, but unfortunately we're, we're coming down to the end. Um, just to share the poll results, what was more interesting? What was the most part, interesting part of today's session? Uh, uh, 46% said expanding my knowledge on global supply chain management. So certainly a really fascinating session on that. And then 28 on understanding 
the constraints of operating during a crisis. So clearly, clearly top of mind for those that are operating in the supply chain and, and uh, our professionals from around the world uh, and 12% uh, learning more about the methods practitioners use. So um, really interesting there. So we're, we're at the hour. Um, any final words for, for our professionals, Mark, we're, we're, uh, and as we sign off? <clears throat> yeah, I'm disappointed in this last poll to have only been able to convince 11% of the audience to consider a career <laughs> in supply chain. <laughs> Uh, but at the same, I think they're a convinced audience. So that the <laughs> most of them are maybe, already in the area. maybe maybe a lot of them already are. Yeah. So then, you know, to have been uh, able to expand the knowledge, you know, is is probably a good achievement. Um, no, it was my pleasure to be here and uh, cover some of these fascinating uh, and interesting topics. Um, I enjoy talking about these things. Uh, I enjoy being a practitioner um, and um, you know continuing you know, to do so. And I hope it was helpful. We so Thank appreciate you. your time. And yes, super fascinating for, for us and, and all those that were on the line. So uh, really, really thankful for your time and, and everyone have, have a great day. Have a great day. And thanks for sharing your passion, Mark. Thank you. It really came through.